Welcome back, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck. With me as ever, David Griscom. Hello, David. Hey, friend. And uh, joining us once again, Matt McManus. Matt is a lecturer at poli -Sci, uh, in poli -Sci at University of Michigan. He's the author of The Political Right and Equality. And his uh, recent book that we're talking about now is The Political Theory of Liberal Socialism. He's also the co-host of the Academic Edgelords podcast. Matt, thank you uh, for joining us once again. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. Uh, love to talk me some philosophy with you guys. Yeah, we're getting into ideas once again. People loved uh, uh, your previous, uh, I think it was on Soul uh, last time you were on. Yeah, actually, uh, that was one of the uh, most hate mailiest uh, interviews I ever <laughs> oh, did. Oh man, I didn't even send you all of them. <laughs> yeah. like, some I got fun, some people love... who were like, Soul would rail your ass so fast that you wouldn't even know what was going to happen. You know the funniest though. thing is, like, not to digress, but like the funniest thing is the comments on that video are so great, Matt, because I'm not trying to be mean, but it's like, there's something about Thomas Soul that sort of gets people of like yeah. a certain level of like written capacity to want to sort of reach for the heavens and uh, yeah there were some really beautiful poems uh in in those comment sections really i gotta go look back at that i had no idea that we had inspired uh literary ruminations uh about tom's thought but yeah no that was a lot of fun um uh, so those yep, guys that. are the funniest um but we're talking we're getting a little bit higher uh and you have this new book the political theory of liberal socialism uh liberal socialism define that for us is that something you're sort of like retroactively constructing out of the pieces of history or is this something you're sort of uncovering that has existed sure absolutely uh so my motivation uh for writing the book was uh twofold right uh one was just an intellectual interest uh in retrieving what i think is a valuable true political tradition uh but the other motivation was a little bit more practical right um a lot of progressives that I know uh, are very contemptuous of liberalism, uh, and I want to be clear, there are a lot of good reasons to be contemptuous of liberalism. Uh, but on the other hand, if you were to ask your average liberal, or sorry, leftist, you know, uh, do you believe in freedom of expression? Uh, they'd probably say yes. Do you believe in the right to vote? Of course. Uh, freedom of religion? Of course. Uh, if anything, they'd say the problem with all those things is that uh, they're not safe in the hands of liberals, uh, and that may very well be. Uh, so I wanted to kind of mince the differences uh, in these outlooks a little bit uh, by talking about liberal socialism. And after my long uh, and sometimes very technical ruminations on the tradition, uh, I came to the conclusion that there are kind of three principles uh, that are core to liberal socialism. Uh, the first one is a commitment to methodological collectivism and normative individualism. Uh, all that means very simply is that liberal socialists, uh, from Paine all the way through Law Rawls, uh, appreciate that human beings are social animals, to use Aristotle's term, uh, and we can only flourish in social settings. Uh, but they're normative individualists in the sense that they think uh, Ultimately, the moral unit of our concern uh, is the individual and their flourishing, not abstract entities like, say, the nation or the people, um, understood as uh, somehow a kind of spiritual entity over and above the individuals that make it up. Uh, the second principle that I argue liberal socialists are committed to uh, is what I call a developmental rather than acquisitive ethic. Uh, and that's a term I borrow from uh, actually Marx and John Stuart Mill, right? So uh, Marx famously said that in a communist society, uh, the development of human powers will be an end in itself for the first time, rather than a kind of means uh, to valorize capital. You know, that's putting it simply. Um, and I said, you know, liberal socialists, Alan Mill or Rawls, uh, are committed to a similar kind of a developmental ethic rather than an inquisitive one, in the sense that they think the purpose of human life is for us to develop our capacities in conjunction with others, right? Uh, to become a really good musician or a really good cook or, you know, be able to lift uh, 400 pounds, whatever it is that you think your capacities are. Uh, whereas an acquisitive ethic is promulgated on this kind of Lockean or Hobbesian idea that the point of life is just to acquire as much stuff, uh, whether through the market or through labor, is something that uh, people would disagree on. Uh, and then the last principle and the one that people will probably be most interested in, uh, as I argue, liberal socialists are committed to achieving what we might call economic democracy, uh, but in a context that's respectful uh, of liberal democratic institutions uh, and most liberal rights. Uh, the exception to that, of course, being um, the liberal right to private property defended by possessive or classical individuals, uh, sorry, liberals, um, all liberal socialists will argue that people have a right to personal property, right? You know, your home, your TV, your car, uh, your cat and your pets, right? Um, but they would deny that uh, people have a right to own, whatever you want to call it, the means of production or the commanding heights of the economy. Uh, and obviously, you know, there's some debate you could have about, well, what counts as personal property and what counts as the commanding heights of the economy? Does a small business fall into which category? Uh, and liberal socialists will break up on this. Uh, 
Um, but I'd say that that's, it, there is a distinction that we can make there that's important. Uh, so these three principles um, in my book, I argue, are core to the liberal socialist tradition. Yeah, and Matt, uh, I don't want this to sound like fighting words, so I'll just explain it. Uh, but uh, this is, Come uh, me, bro. in a way, are you sort of the, I, I see you as sort of the mirror image of our boy Dave Rubin, uh, <laughs> arguing uh, for a linear, here's Dave Rubin talking about his version of uh, liberalism. I think what you're seeing here is mainly al along that trajectory of uh, collectivism. I think Dave uh, rejects that, but uh, let's see how this, uh, how he fits into your schema here. You grow up and you are, I hate to say liberal because it's not, because liberals in the sane world, true liberals would be making a lot of sense right now. I still consider myself a classical liberal in a sane world. We don't live in a sane world right now, so I have to, to defend my classical liberal values. I have to, I have to sort of be more of an ally um, or a co-fighter, let's say, with conservatives. And so you think that, on the contrary, that liberals should be fighting, and, and it actually makes sense that they are, it's it's not so crazy that they would fight alongside socialists. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I want to point out, um, this isn't my idea, right? It's actually an idea I drew from a lot of right-wing thinkers. Uh, as you mentioned, my previous book was The Political Right and Equality, uh, a long, I hope interesting, uh, kind of digression uh, on the political right. Uh, and it's worth noting that conservatives uh, have always understood liberalism to be a revolutionary, egalitarian, uh, and unpalatable tradition, uh, going all the way back to the French Revolution. Uh, and one of the things that I spend quite a bit of time in the book digressing on uh, is how a certain kind of liberalism came to be aligned with the right. Uh, now, I don't want to bore everyone with a great deal of the details. Uh, a lot of my story is very inspired by people like Marx, uh, where I talk about how this alignment of liberalism with capital in many ways led it to become uh, more pro-capitalist than pro-freedom and equality the way it should have been. Uh, but I also agree with people like Sam Moyne. Uh, some people might know and have read his book, uh, Liberalism Against Itself. Uh, really great book. Uh, and he was one of the core influences uh, on my own book. Uh, and he points out that during the Cold War, um, what he calls Cold War liberals, uh, move to the right. Uh, and one of the things that they did was, in a sense, uh, obfuscate uh, or even try to water down uh, the revolutionary history of liberalism. Uh, and you'd even find them try to foreground figures like Edmund Burke, um, who don't necessarily belong in the liberal spectrum, uh, as antecedents while dismissing people like, say, um, Thomas Paine uh, or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who have a much more clear uh, link to at least the early forms uh, of liberalism that emerged. Uh, but look, uh, I want to be pretty clear here, right? Um, my book is a defense of liberal socialism, or at least a retrieval of liberal socialism. I'm very clear that there are many kinds of liberalism out there that I think leftists should be very critical of. Uh, that obviously includes neoliberalism, which has been a catastrophe, uh, both in theory and practice for the world. Uh, and I would add that neoliberalism itself emerges from this out of this classical liberal mindset uh, that is predicated on uh, what C.B. McPherson calls uh, commitment to possessive individualism, right? This kind of atomistic idea uh, that the world consists of self-interested and selfish individuals, each trying to acquire as much for themselves as they can, uh, and through their labor, uh, trying to acquire the matter of the world, and if they can't do that directly, selling their labor to others uh, in order to acquire the goods of the world. Uh, and McPherson points out, I think very convincingly, uh, that this outlook usually starts from a position uh, of radical equality. If you think about Locke's commitment uh, to the idea that in the state of nature we're all free, or Hobbes's commitment to the idea that in the state of nature we're all equal. Uh, but McPherson points out that all the classical liberals later reach the conclusion that in the event uh, that we start out with this kind of equality and freedom, uh, people through their own efforts uh, are going to become fundamentally unequal, uh, and the state should respect that. Uh, as Locke put it in the Second Treatise of Government, uh, the earth doesn't belong to everybody, it belongs to the industrious and the rational in the long run, right? Uh, and liberal socialists push very heavily against that uh, by insisting no, right? Uh, a genuine commitment to freedom for all, equality for all, uh, and indeed solidarity for all uh, requires us to adopt a much more kind of egalitarian social system and a much more democratic social system uh, than classical liberals, let alone the old liberals, would permit. So, you know, uh, if, if you look through kind of like the early history of, of, of liberalism as a philosophy, or even just like a lot of like European moral philosophy, I think it's very fair to say that like you can see some of the seeds of, of the coming like socialism, right? In the mm -hmm. sense of, uh, you know, this the ideas of like um, egalitarianism, uh, pushing back against <laughs> the privilege of blood, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
So why not just have liberalism in the kind of typical, maybe Marxist sense, be a predecessor um, to socialism? Um, why actually combine these two philosophies, right? And like attaching that to the, that question is like, what is illiberal about socialism, right? Why why do we attach this uh, this tradition to to socialism, or what is lacking? Or, go ahead. Absolutely. I mean, uh, well, one of the reasons for doing that is just historical accuracy, right? Uh, one of the points that I try to make in the book is that socialism and liberalism uh, have figures in common uh, who identify with both traditions, or at least inspire both traditions, uh, and it's worth inquiring into that. Uh, just to give two examples that I foreground in the book. Uh, Thomas Paine, right, uh, was absolutely instrumental in fermenting the American Revolution, wrote a really interesting conflict uh, pamphlet called uh, Common Sense, where he mocked the aristocracy uh, and lampooned it, uh, arguing, you know, that clearly a Republican system of government of the sort that the Americans are going to found would be much better. Uh, but then later on in his career, inspired by the French Revolution, uh, he wrote a book, uh, The Rights of Man. Uh, and in the second part of The Rights of Man, he's one of the first people to say, actually, property is not a natural but a social institution. Uh, that means that people who acquire a lot of property owe society a debt for its possession, and if they don't pay that debt, then they're essentially robbing the poor, right? And he goes on to argue for quite a robust welfare system uh, on the basis of this kind of reasoning. Uh, and Paine would go on to influence generations of liberals, but also generations of socialists with this attitude. Uh, or another people person that I bring up uh, who's pretty central to the early part of the book is uh, John Stuart Mill, right? Uh, Problematic figure, as I point out, staunch defender of European imperialism. We should be very critical of him for that. Uh, but Mill also drew a deep elective affinity uh, between liberalism and socialism and identified as a socialist uh, in his mature period. Uh, and the reason was pretty simple, right, where he says, look, uh, liberals have done a great thing for the world. Uh, by emancipating people from aristocratic society uh, and the kind of mythologies and ideologies uh, and hegemony uh, that were associated with that aristocratic system. Uh, but he then goes on to say liberals have not gone far enough uh, because they are way too willing uh, to permit exactly the same kinds of domination in the economy uh, by allowing the capitalist system to just run its course uh, without any consideration for the negative impact this has on workers in particular. Uh, and in his classic track, Socialism, uh, he even says, look, uh, Socialists have good claim to be the heirs of liberalism because liberals were the lev the levelers of previous times, uh, whereas socialists are the levelers uh, of the contemporary age. And he really means that as a positive thing. Uh, he calls socialists the more far-sighted successors of liberalism in some ways. Uh, but of course, Mill says, look, uh, we need to be really careful here in rejecting command, economic, and authoritarian versions of socialism, of the sort that he always already was worried were bubbling up uh, in some circles. Uh, we need to be committed to a socialism that's respectful of individual liberties, uh, that is bottom-up rather than top-down, uh, and that creates space for the development of human individuality rather than trying to reduce everyone to the same level. And that leads me, I think, to the second point that I'm trying to get at beyond history. Uh, one of the reasons that I felt it was important to foreground liberal socialism rather than just socialism or liberalism uh, is the kind of socialism that I'm committed to would be respectful uh, of individual rights, would put limitations on the state, uh, and would be bottom-up rather than top-down in the way that Mill describes. Uh, and I think that there are good reasons to embrace such a socialism uh, and the kind of liberal aspects that would be associated with it. Uh, now, I want to be clear, right? My book is not a full defense of what I think liberal socialism should look like. It's mostly talking about other people. Uh, but that was a kind of normative impulse behind uh, the book for that reason. Not to be too glib, but, <laughs> you know, to paraphrase uh, like Lenin, uh, you know, freedom for who and freedom to do what? Um, are, are we talking about the, these, you know, these impositions here? Oh, absolutely. So um, one of the main chapters of the book um, the two main chapters of the book are the ones on Rawls and ones on Marx, right? Uh, the chapter on Marx, uh, I address this question pretty substantially, right? Uh, so Marx was a brilliant thinker, right? Uh, and one of the things that I point out is that his views on liberalism are actually quite a bit more complicated uh, than the cliche sometimes goes, right? Uh, but I do think that we can be critical of him around the time period of the Communist Manifesto uh, for advocating for a kind of democratic centralism uh, of the sort that would later become promulgated, uh, at least to a certain extent, in the Soviet Union and other authoritarian communist systems, uh, where individual liberties, democratic participation was quashed uh, in a certain kind of way. Uh, but the later Marx, the Marx who wrote The Civil War in France, uh, seems to have been 
attendant uh, to these difficulties uh, when he advocated for a much more decentralized, a much more participatory system of government uh, than what you see in the manifesto with his calls for democratic uh, centralism. Uh, For instance, he says, look, uh, the National Assembly in France is, of course, going to play a major role in coordinating the different communes that are going to merge in the country post-revolution, but they should be radically democratic uh, in the sense that people should be automatically able to recall uh, any deputies in the National Assembly if they feel that they're not doing a good job. Uh, And Paris shouldn't govern everything, right? The different communes that are going to merge in the country should have a lot of powers devolved to them uh, because it's important for people to participate locally uh, in the kind of commune uh, that they identify with or that they're a member of uh, because socialism is supposed to have this uh, solidaristic element to it. So I think that Marx himself was aware of the fact uh, that some of the more Leninist forms uh, of socialism that he himself might have endorsed earlier on had serious problems to them uh, and was trying to rectify uh, these difficulties uh, in his later work. And, you know, we can digress on this uh, a little bit more if you want um, and maybe talk a little bit about Marx's own views on liberalism if you feel like it. But that's, I think, uh, I'd answer that question. You know, I, I don't want to, I do want to get back to that, but before we move on too far from John Stuart Mill, one of <laughs> yeah. your footnotes has uh, what a really great, uh, I think, succinct thing that I think the internet, particularly young men, uh, getting masculinity advice from the internet should see, which is this, um, you write in this footnote, um, Mill uh, stressed that while weak men tend to insist on inequities yeah. to maintain a sense of security about their position, strong men yearn to interact with another as equals. I that is something that like I don't want to like act like I'm um, you know Vin Diesel and Fast and Furious. I'm, that's something that I've always intuited. Like you, it, it's you're weak that you want to you sort of enforce these hierarchies <laughs> as opposed to uh, see people as equals. Like I, that was such like a, a you know great thought um, that you included there. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because I was actually inspired to put that there in part because. Uh... I do deal with a lot of fascist anons uh, online all the time uh, who are prone to calling people, you know, peasants and trash and, you know, Jews and all that stuff. Uh, And I always just found that extremely vulgar uh, and definitely coming from a place of, let's call it that, what it is, weakness, right? Uh, This kind of anxiety to assert your status over people uh, because you're not really all that confident about it. I think that from a psychological standpoint, Mill is absolutely right. If you're a really confident secure and you feel like you're a strong person, uh, then you want to deal with other people uh, as an equal because you want to deal with other people like they're also strong, confident, and secure because you imagine you'll get more from that relationship than you would one of subordination. Uh, Just to give credit where it's due, uh, I'd also say that's not just an insight I picked up from um, John Stuart Mill. Uh, I didn't footnote her, but uh, Simone de Beauvoir makes a very similar claim uh, in The Second Sex when it comes to uh, feminist relations, right? Where she says uh, men would get a lot more from being in a romantic relationship with a woman who is his equal and who he treats as an equal uh, than he would from a woman that he tries desperately to subordinate. Uh, and of course, Mel would have agreed with that since he was uh, himself a feminist and wrote uh, eloquently on these matters. Uh, and um, w- uh, sorry, <clears throat> his book, uh, The Subjection of Women. Yeah, John Stuart Mill, um, Simone de Beauvoir, and uh, Mike Racine on this program, uh, uh, you know, telling Stephen Crowder that it's much better to, you know, be slightly afraid of your wife from Long Island than, uh, you know, having a wife that you can dominate. Um, uh, anyway, do you want to get back to Marx? Because as you write in your book, there's some people who kind of are sick of the Marx conversation. I don't yeah. think that's David or I. I don't want to speak for David, but I think I can speak for David. Um, anything else on the Marx um, uh, stuff we want to talk about? Like, you you know, a- antis- objections you get from the more Marxisty types. Is there anything you feel like you need to address? Well, you know, just mm-hmm. like to, to deliver one. Um, I sure. think that one that you're going to, you're, I, you anticipate in the book many, many times, and I know you're, you're already ready for it. Um, it's this kind of question of, of idealism, right? You yeah. know, a lot of, a lot of the liberalism that we're talking about here does sort of, in my opinion, operate from that kind of idealism versus like the, you know, the way Marx would sort of look at, you know, you, you mentioned things like that you want to reject from the liberal tradition, for example, like, you know, mm-hmm. like free trade, neoliberal and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, understanding the history as to why, you know, free trade was so important to like liberalism, a lot of it was like the United Kingdom, 
extremely advanced economy. It wants to sort of boom down any kind of walls or protections um, that it, you know it encounters. So yes, it might talk about the towers of universality and like you know the beauty of freedom of exchange, but it just knows it's going to make more money if it can sort of force all these other nations to accept trade with it. Um, I mean, how, how how do you sort of respond to you know this question of one um, you know the, the liberalism that we're we're attaching to socialism um, being idealist, um, and I know that you sort of don't uh, you, you sort of make a distinction between socialism and Marxism too. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't want to put you in that position. But the, 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 yes, on the, on the question of idealism, um, you know, what, what's your response? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and intellectual honesty compels you, me to say, uh, I don't have a firm answer to that yet. Uh, like I said, this is kind of a retrieval, not a defense. Uh, if I were to write my own, you know, li a liberal justice political theory or a liberal socialist justice political theory, right, book, then uh, I'd probably have to account for this in more detail. So I think I'll just say... Um, Two, th three things, right? Uh, first off, I've already gotten some really good critiques uh, by Marxist friends of mine, or people, or people who are um, very sympathetic to a more Marxist kind of socialism. People like Enzo Rossi or, or Lindley Tucheria, uh, and I welcome them, right? So, if you don't like my approach to this, feel free to send me an email, explain to me why I'm wrong. I'll listen to it, I promise, uh, and I'll do my best to respond uh, as long as it's done in good taste, right? If you just message me that whole, you know, fuck you, you know, whatever, then. Uh, you're going to get the response that you deserve. Uh, I think I'll say two things about this and subsequently, right? First off, uh, drawing very heavily on people like, say, uh, Igor Shokabrad, um or Rawls, for that matter, uh, I point out that Marx actually had a much more complex vision uh, of liberalism than he's sometimes known to have, right? Uh, so it's worth noting, right, that Marx himself uh, was a consistent defender uh, of all the important liberal rights uh, over the course of his career. Uh, obviously, that included freedom of assembly for socialist parties and workers' movements, uh, freedom of expression, which he was particularly keen to defend, given that people kept on trying to censor his newspapers and deprive him of livelihood. Uh, and of course, you know, rights of political agitation, voting rights for the working class, uh, you name it, right? Uh, so it's not that Marx was indifferent to liberal rights. To your point about materialism and historicism, uh, he just felt that they were a historical accomplishment that was not the end game for what we should be aspiring to in a society committed to equality and freedom. Uh, and, you know, I also draw very heavily on his uh, critique of the Gotha program, uh, where he chastises some of the more utopian socialists for presuming, right, that we can transcend the limitations uh, of bourgeois society through this kind of uh, millenarian revolutionary attitude, uh, which I still think, by the way, is very prominent. Uh, because Marx says no, right? The idea that we can kind of have a year one style revolution uh, where we'll wake up and everything is different uh, is fundamentally ahistorical and anti-materialist. Uh, any new society that you create is going to be, to use this term, stamped by many features of the old, uh, which means that there are going to be many characteristics of the bourgeois epic. Uh, that carry on into socialism for an indefinite period of time, right? Uh, now, of course, he doesn't give us a strict timeline for that because he's not into writing recipe books for the cook shops of the future, right? Uh, but I take this point pretty seriously. Uh, and so sometimes I push back and say, actually, in some ways, it's more materialist and more historicist to assume that any socialism that emerges uh, from a liberal society is going to be stamped by liberalism in certain important ways. Uh, and maybe we should be grateful for that. Uh, the second point that I want to bring up, though, to your more uh, deep objection, uh, is that I think there is a problem with the way the book is structured uh, as a piece of um, intellectual history uh, and normative political theory. Uh, I completely concede that many liberal socialists uh, and much of the thought that emerges in liberal socialism is deeply deficient in terms of theorizing things like economic power, the forms of economic power that merge within history, uh, and that is a very serious problem in liberal socialist political theory uh, that I don't think anybody has really adequately addressed. Uh, and I point out that uh, everyone from Mill to Rawls uh, to even Chantal Mouffe uh, is subject to it, right? They spend a lot more time writing recipe books for the cook shops of the future rather than looking at the actual mechanisms of power that are operative at any given time. So in my own kind of flavor of liberal socialism, uh, I wanted to be a lot more Marxist than what came before uh, by incorporating uh, an adequate theory of power and domination and history. Uh, but as I mentioned, I'm not quite sure how to do that yet. Uh, maybe 10 years down the line, right? Again, you'll see, you know, a liberal socialist theory of justice or some plagiarized title like that. Uh, and then you'll know that I've come up with something that's <laughs> adequate, but we're not there yet. Well, you know, on this a little bit, maybe to pull it, um, away from just talking specifically about figures, like let's talk about like liberalism as, as a philosophy, right? Like liberal rights, um, mm -hmm. because 
you know, I, I think that you're, I think you're very correct. For example, even within the Marxist tradition of actually upholding this idea that like, there's weird thing that has gone on online now, I think, uh, where you got a lot of leftists and like kind of Twitter Marxists who think yeah. that like, you know, socialism was like opposed to like concepts like freedom of speech or things like that, which again, I find to be kind of ahistorical for the most part, but looking at um you know the whole gamut of what comes uh, under like liberal democracy under li liberal political theory um you know so i think like some of these individual rights we like but you wrote a little bit about like separation of powers and, and things mm -hmm. of that nature um mm -hmm. you know could you talk about why you think that's important um because you know i'll just sort of love the like a quick version of an argument that like for me, there's a lot of these things like in the American system, mm -hmm. things like the Supreme Court, things like the Senate right. um, are sort of set up to limit the power of, of the people or the mob or, or, or the masses or whatever um, folks might like to call them. Um, you know, is that something that we would want to inherit into a, a socialist uh, society? I think we have to be really careful here. Um because they're kind of fine-grained distinctions and quite fine-grained judgments that we have to make, right? So uh, I think they're absolutely correct that for many classical liberals, uh, let's use James Madison as an example, uh, imposing restrictions uh, on the demos or the majority uh, usually meant imposing restrictions on the working class majority to prevent them from expropriating the rich. Uh, and he's very express about this, I should say, uh, Madison in Federalist 10, right, where he's actually sounds quite a bit like a Marxist at some parts, uh, whereas like, look, every society is going to be riven by class conflict. The primary job of the state is to manage class conflict. Uh, and then Madison, of course, says, uh, but it should manage it in favor of the rich uh, because that'll be beneficent. Uh, and a lot of people aren't familiar with this, but when he talks about doesn't quite use this terminology, but minorities that are threatened by majorities uh, in a Republican system. Uh, what he's talking about aren't usually religious minorities. Sometimes he gestures in that direction. Uh, again, he's talking about the rich, who is where the poor are going to try to fleece if you give them too much power. Uh, so this is precisely why we need to impose checks uh, on what Madison sometimes calls a pure democracy, uh, which is potentially uh, going to give way to all kinds of mischief, right? Uh, and I think in those respects, of course, socialists are very right to be skeptical uh, of arguments for a division of powers or anti-majoritarian measures uh, because they're essentially being implemented to try to restrict uh, the formation of class consciousness uh, and the expropriation of the expropriators. On the other hand, uh, Irving Howe, uh, who influenced this point, uh, wrote a really good essay for uh, Dissent Magazine, uh, I think it was in the 1970s, uh, Liberalism and Socialism, Articles of Conciliation. Uh, where he points out that going too far in the direction of dismissing arguments for, let's say, minority rights uh, or the division of powers uh, led socialism to some pretty damaging places uh, where there is this assumption, right, that uh, we should just be purely uninhibited uh, and trying to do what a majority of the people want, uh, at least as understood by the party, without any kind of compunctions, right? Uh, and Howe says, look, uh, in these kinds of circumstances, it's worthwhile to think what kind of minority rights we would want to put on a place, even in a socialist society, uh, to offer protections uh, for religious groups or unpopular groups uh, that might be threatened uh, by, say, socially conservative uh, kind of outlooks. Uh, or we might want to ask ourselves, what kind of limitations do we want the state to impose upon itself uh, so that even though we would have a very powerful and democratic legislature, it's not the case that the legislature could just pass any laws it wants without any kind of scrutiny about whether or not that's actually going to provide benefits uh, for certain kinds of people. Uh, now, how this could cash itself out uh, in terms of a design for political institutions um, I don't really talk about it a great deal in the book. Uh, I'd be the first, though, to say to your point about the Supreme Court that uh, I'm not a very big fan of the American Supreme Court right now. Uh, I tend to agree with people like Aziz Rana or Samuel Moyne that it is fundamentally a reactionary institution. Uh, I don't necessarily think that we should just give up the idea of having a Supreme Court uh, and a constitution, but it should be significantly disempowered uh, relative to what it is right now, uh, and maybe approximate something that's a little bit more like a, a European court, uh, which is far more deferential to the democratic will. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I find that to be like- Also, fuck, uh, sorry, just so uh, we get something out of the way, fuck Clarence Thomas, right? Uh, <laughs> let's get that out of the way right out of the way from the get-go. Right? You know, uh, I do, I think it's one of, and I think it's because it has key words that sort of resonate with folks uh, today. Nothing gets me more nuts than when people start uh, talking about, you know, defending, um, you know, the minority from the tyranny of the majority um, in, this, in this country. Because, like, you'll hear left liberals sort of talk about it sometimes because they think, oh, look, the founding fathers of yeah. a country founded on slavery were thinking about minority rights. Um, and no, they were talking about themselves. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, like, 
Sorry, right. Charles Mills, uh, the great black radical uh, liberal, uh, had a nice phrase about that where he was like, when the founders and the classical liberals talked about justice, what they really meant was just us, right? Uh, and I think that's <laughs> that's pretty accurate. Well, it's been funny with Biden sort of in limbo uh, in his campaign. You have some people saying, hey, don't listen to the mob telling him to get out. And then Biden also saying, hey, it's the elites uh, that want. And yeah. the truth is, like, it's mm -hmm. kind of both, Joe. <laughs> you know, both kind of the elites and the mob uh, want you to get out. Um, any more on Marx, uh, David? You want? I mean, you know, it's it's uh, uh, somewhat related to Marx, but just you know, on this kind of question of, of separation, though, I, I just to sort of push this a little bit. Um, okay, so we can recognize that the Supreme Court right now is like a reactionary body, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I mean, how can we make that kind of determination, like in in, in your framework, right? Because like for for like a Marxist, you make the arguments like you know these are these are just organs of class power, right? Um, you know if you know how how can we sort of make these kind of more universalist positions, um, you know, fit in with that kind of class analysis of like why the Senate operates in the way that it does or why the Supreme Court operates in the way that it does? Um, because you know I don't think it would f feel acceptable to like a liberal paradigm to just say like well I don't like what it's doing therefore. Or, you know, it's, it's, it no longer works for us, right? It's a little easier for the Marxists just to say it's the rich, right? You know, or the powerful. Oh, absolutely, right. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I had another book that came out earlier this year, uh, co-authored with um, Dr. Leslie Jacobs, uh, called "Against Post Liberal Courts and Justice," uh, and it's about reinvigorating the legacy uh, of a constitutional theorist called uh, Ronald Dworkin, who some of uh, your listeners might be familiar with. Uh, but one of the points that I make in this book is that. Marxist scholars have typically been relatively indifferent uh, to the content of legal document, uh, like doctrine, right? These kinds of arguments about how to interpret the Constitution, how should judges uh, read the law, right? Uh, precisely because, and I think quite rightly, they say, uh, to a certain extent, that's not really all that important, right? Because judges are just going to rule in a way that retrenches the power uh, of the ruling class. Uh, now, even if you agree with that, I do not think that that's a reason for leftists not to invade uh, on doctrinal questions, precisely because to the extent that we are going to live with this system for quite a long time, it is important for us to offer in alternative visions of constitutional interpretation that will be more attractive and more compelling uh, to, let's say, the average liberal in the United States uh, than what's on offer from the right right now, which is you know various species of originalism, various species of common good, so-called constitutionalism, uh, Schmidtianism, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that there's a core audience for that. Uh, so to use a kind of Gramscian term here, uh, what we need to do is offer an imminent critique of conservative legal doctrine uh, while offering alternatives to that that operate within the system but will change the outcomes in such a way that society will move in a more democratic and egalitarian direction uh, through the kind of judgments that a reconfigured Supreme Court uh, would push it uh, were they to adopt these different modes of interpretation that I think would be more conducive to left-wing names. Uh, now, I don't want to get too much into this because I talk about it a lot in that book, uh, but I think that's where reading people like the critical legal theorist or reading left liberals like Ronald Dworkin uh, can be very helpful because they do address these kind of doctrinal questions in a way a lot of Marxists uh, and a lot of leftists understandably just aren't all that interested in, but they should be. And, you know, we won't, we're not getting to every uh, thinker that you cover in there, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft and a few others you've mentioned. Um, I, I was, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I had the conception of uh, Keynes, the economist, <laughs> yeah. uh, that he basically just saved capitalism. Uh, that's not correct? Well, it's interesting, right? I have kind of mixed feelings about him uh, that I talk about uh, in the book, right? So, there are kind of two interpretations of Keynes, uh, and I think that that's in part because Keynes himself was divided uh, in these matters, right? Uh, on the one hand, there's no doubt that Keynes was as bourgeois as they possibly come, right? Uh, you could even see that in the really kind of condescending uh, attitude he took towards Marxism throughout the course of his life, uh, the way that he tended to be deferential uh, to certain kind of bourgeois mores, uh, and certainly uh, the way that he saw himself as, let's put it this way, a systems man, right? Uh, he wanted to work within the system to reform it uh, rather than engage in kind of revolutionary agitation to destroy it. On the other hand, right, uh, what I point out is, uh, drawing upon uh, Crotty's book, um, Keynes' Liberal Socialism, uh, he actually had quite an ambitious program uh, for how he thought the economy should be restructured. Uh, and he was explicit in characterizing this as a form of liberal socialism. Uh, now, 
I talk about this a lot in the book, and I don't want to get into all the technical details about Keynesian economics uh, that might bore people. Uh, but long story short, uh, Keynes argued that economic thought need to be fundamentally reconfigured uh, if we were to have a more successful and democratic system uh, that would work in the interest of everybody. Uh, so one of the things that he consistently points out is that in a very Marxist vein, uh, there's this operative assumption in classical political economy that individual actors working in their self-interest uh, will invariably produce optimistic outcomes for everybody uh, because every transaction uh, will be to utility maximizing in some way, shape, or form. So how could it not be um, you know, beneficial to everybody? Uh, that's putting it really crudely when it comes to the history of economic thought, but that's the gist of it, right? Uh, and Keynes, of course, said no, right? Uh, people working in their self-interest, even if they engage in utility-maximizing transactions, uh, can actually produce outcomes that are disastrous uh, for society as a whole. Uh, and he pointed out, uh, certainly in the 1930s, that this isn't just a theoretical issue. Uh, that's the reason he thought for the Great Depression, right? Uh, it was the fact that uh, individual capitalists, when they're with withholding investments, this is just one example, uh, were acting in their rational self-interest because the market was shit at that point. Uh, why would you invest when the market was shit? Uh, but the problem, of course, is that all of them withholding their investments meant that the economy uh, never got any better, right? Uh, to use a famous description, uh, people became aware of the fact that the economy uh, was kind of like an elevator, right? Uh, it could go up or down, and it was just as easy for it to stay at the bottom floor uh, as it was at the top level. Uh, so Keynes's argument is, look, uh, the way that we can overcome these difficulties uh, is through the state taking a much more preeminent role in trying to organize the economy for the benefit of everybody uh, and muting uh, a lot of these irrationalist tendencies uh, or damaging tendencies that emerge when individuals just pursue their self-interest without any regard for the common good. Uh, and Keynes's liberal socialism uh, was very much predicated on the idea that the state wouldn't necessarily be the owner of the means of production, uh, but it would appropriate much of the surplus wealth, if not all of the surplus wealth that was generated through market mechanisms, uh, and then reinvest them uh, in successful firms uh, and in social policies uh, that were intended to ameliorate wealth. This would be, oh, sorry, ameliorate uh, poverty. Um, this would be complemented by higher levels of unionization uh, and more democratic involvement in the affairs of state. Uh, and I want to be clear that I don't really find this a particularly attractive vision of liberal socialism because it's highly status, uh, not democratic enough, uh, and not ambitious enough, I think, to actually achieve a lot of the outcomes that Keynes wants it to achieve. Uh, but I point to him in the book um, for two reasons, right? One, he's just a very interesting figure that I think a lot of people have opinions about, so how could he not be there? Uh, and secondly, to try to convince some, let's call it this, uh, liberals, right? Uh, that liberal socialism a la Keynes isn't such an out there ideas. Uh, many liberals uh, have a deep abiding nostalgia for the era of the Keynesian welfare state. Uh, and the point I'm trying to make is if they have a lot of nostalgia for that, uh, they should acknowledge what Keynes was really trying to achieve, which was a kind of liberal socialism. You know, it, well, it's, that's, it's, that's, I was just going to say real quick, that's the direction I would send our friends who are very uh, obsessed with the modern monetary theory. Uh, exactly. You know, let's, 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 you know, put a little bit more meat on those bones. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And this goes back to like the eminent critique also, right? I mean, w one of the things that I've been trying to do for a long time uh, is convince liberals that the consistent application and interpretation of their own principles should lead them in a socialist direction. Right now, it doesn't have to. And I think because of the distortions imposed by capital, uh, in many cases, it won't. Right. Uh, but I think that there are good reasons to try to argue in this way, uh, precisely for the reasons that Gramsci teaches us. Right. Uh, it's a lot easier to convince someone to adopt a radical perspective uh, if you say your own principles should push you in that direction uh, than by telling someone your principles are crap, uh, drop them and adopt these principles instead. Because we all know that people aren't very likely to be receptive to that message, except in very rare circumstances. Right. You know, I, I was just laughing uh, at Matt's statement there because it is a kind of weird irony, I guess, of, of this moment that it is like somebody like a democratic socialist from Vermont or some of the folks <laughs> yeah. in, in the Jacobin universe who are trying to remind liberals. It's like, hey, you'll have like a pretty interesting political tradition. <laughs> Maybe you should defend it. Or, um, yeah. It's, yeah. It, I mean, it's, look what's it happened recently, right? It's fucking, it's been democratic socialists who have been the most militant in trying to guard America's democratic institutions, right? Uh, it's pretty clear at this point that 
the centrist in the Democratic Party uh, don't really care all that much about stopping Trump uh, and that they aren't particularly good at doing that anyway, right? Uh, and to your point, Dave, I don't think that's a coincidence, right? So um, talking a little bit um, uh, about this conception of, of, of liberal socialism, too, it's like, I mean, I just think, you know, we can't avoid this. I think it'd be a mistake not to, um, you know, to talk about class conflict um, as, as a kind of fundamental reality of, of, of socialism. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I, I'm going to ask you two questions here. It's like one, if you like accept that as a, as a part of, of socialism. Um, um, but then if, um, um, as an, in addition to that, um, you know, I mean, liberalism sort of, to, to my understanding, uh, liberalism as a political philosophy sort of recognize in politics, there's conflict. Conflict can create absolute chaos. Conflict can upend a system. Conflict can lead to dangerous, dangerous outcomes. So if we sort of put, um, you know, guardrails um, or rules on democracy on how we do politics, we can sort of prevent some of those maybe excesses um, that, that can come from it. Um, interesting enough, but oftentimes that can sort of mask, uh, you know, the classic character of things. When you say certain things are untouchable by politics, let's call it private property, for example, um, you are sort of saying, okay, politics cannot go here, um, which means that the fundamental contradictions or conflicts that are baked into the system will always maintain themselves. So under liberal socialism, I mean, how does it sort of deal with this kind of conception of, uh, you know, of, of, of class politics? Um, uh, you know, sorry, the, the, the conflict, uh, class conflict that's sort of inherent under capitalism. And is it just sort of wanting to do things like, hey, if we get universal basic income, if we get, you know, protections for workers, if we can guarantee, you know, certain kind of goods, a certain standard of living for folks, we've done the kind of fixing of, 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 of this fundamental contradiction? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so... I'm going to answer that question both theoretically with reference to a figure uh, and then more practically in terms of what I would do, right? Uh, so I want to point out first off that uh, every liberal socialist thinker uh, does have an account of class conflict baked into their system, uh, whether it's adequate or ad inadequate um, or militant enough is something that, of course, we can ask. Uh, although I point out that some liberal socialists like Chantal Mouffe, for example, uh, have a much more agonistic conception of society than others, like, say, Axel Honneth, who I also talk about, right, uh, who are much more prone to emphasizing in Hegelian vein uh, that we should seek reconciliation uh, where we can, right? Uh, but let's just go to a canonical figure. I mentioned that Marx was um, the one of the two most important chapters in the book. The other one was on Rawls, right? Uh, so Rawls is sometimes chastised for having a kind of anti-political view of political theory. Uh, and one of the main accusations is precisely that he's unaware uh, of the importance or centrality of class conflict in a given society. Now, I think that there is... A legitimate argument to be made that he does not take that seriously enough, uh, but he was aware of that, right? Uh, and I point out that in his account of liberal socialism, one of the primary arguments he makes for it uh, isn't even economic, but political, right? Where he says, even in a welfare state system, uh, vast inequalities uh, in wealth and power are going to emerge. Uh, and the reason it's going to be wealth and power is precisely because enormous concentrations of wealth invariably lead to enormous concentrations of political power of the sort he said were emerging in the United States circa the 2000s. Uh, and he argued that we need a liberal socialist system uh, precisely because the political rights that people enjoy uh, or should enjoy uh, in a society uh, will not have fair value uh, in a system where economic power uh, is allowed to run rampant uh, in the way that it has under neoliberal systems. Uh, and of course, he says that's going to mean that the working classes uh, or the lower orders uh, are going to get fair value uh, from their political rights in a way that they don't right now. Right. Uh, so. I think there's a clear cognizance uh, of those issues there. Uh, and Marx also points, or sorry, Rawls also points out that he draws this insight from um, the Marxist tradition, right? Particularly Hegel and uh, people like G.A. Cohen, right? Uh, again, whether or not you're satisfied with that or not, we'd have to go through it figure by figure, right? Uh, in terms of how I think liberal socialists should overcome um, the contradiction between classes uh, in contemporary society, uh, I personally usually come down uh, on a kind of market socialism predicated on workplace democracy, right? Uh, where my argument is that we should do what John Stuart Mills advocated for, uh, which is to essentially eliminate the, the 
capitalist class and capitalist ownership of the means of production and allow workers to manage firms themselves um, in the way that you see uh, in cooperatives like say, the Mondragon Corps. And my ideal economy would consist uh, of worker managed firms uh, competing with one another in a market system. Uh, but a lot of the wealth would be, of course, be very, very heavily taxed and redistributed to the lower orders. Now, I'm very well aware that some socialists will be critical of that by saying, Market socialism with workplace democracy, obviously a big step forward, uh, but to use G.A. Cohen's term, it wouldn't be full reciprocity uh, of the sort that we'd want to see uh, in a socialist system. Uh, this is from Cohen's book, uh, Why Not Socialism, where he was uh, kind of ambiguous uh, about he thought what he thought were the merits uh, of market socialism. Uh, and I can appreciate this, right? I understand that in a system where there are competitive markets, as there would be even in the system that I described, uh, you might say, well, there's still going to be this kind of agonistic, competitive, anti-communitarian ethic that will emerge uh, as different workers' firms will compete with one another and try to outdo one another. Uh, and I'm perfectly willing to say, if we were to set up the system that I'm talking about, it is well within uh, the possibility uh, for us to try to experiment with going beyond even something like this. Uh, that's a point, actually, Thomas Piketty brings up in his book, um, uh, an introduction to equality, where he argues for something similar. Uh, but I think that we can start with this model uh, as a beginning, uh, moving, you know, uh, as Bascon Sarkar would put it, uh, five minutes after capitalism, uh, and then see where it takes us. Uh, and I would also argue that the model that I'm put forward uh, is more realistic in some respects uh, than alternative uh, visions that are sometimes put forward uh, that are usually extremely ambiguous uh, in terms of what would be entailed um, by a transition uh, to this more kind of uh, idealized form of socialism. Uh, just to give one example, Cohen in the book that I mentioned, Why Not Socialism, uh, says, you know, market socialism is limited in the sense that we don't have true or full reciprocity. Uh, but then he concedes, I have no idea what it would look like to have a society with full or true reciprocity. Uh, I just don't want us to give up on the ideal. Uh, and I'm the first one to say, look, we shouldn't give up on the ideal, right? Uh, but let's move to a better system and then see where life takes us afterwards. Uh, and I also think that's a more materialist attitude, right? It's, the idea is, uh, we move to a society that will still be stamped by many features of the old. Uh, once we've we've advance that far, who knows what horizons might open up afterwards. Matt McManus, the book is The Political Theory of Liberal Socialism. Is that, out, is that for pre-order now? Or it's available for pre-order, yeah. You can uh, get it on the Rutledge site. Um, or, you know, if you're feeling naughty, you can always find it on Amazon, right? But uh, I don't encourage you to do that, you know, get it, get it on Rutledge. Yeah, well, you heard them. Get, get the pre-order at Rutledge. Uh, Matt, thanks again for, uh, you know, we're going to have to go in recovery mode from our brain uh, getting all these ideas in it. Uh, but uh, we really appreciate you once again doing that for us. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Always a great time.